That's what we're dealing with. Right. Uh, hello, everybody. I thought I'd do one of these because a couple of people have been whining. I haven't done them for a while. Did them through the pandemic. Hundreds, I did. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah. I, I, I think you've still got it. There's some of the questions coming in. Absolute bollocks. Uh, which is sort of the remit. Really? <laughs> so well done. Uh, you haven't lost, you haven't lost your touch. I had so many, again, hundreds. I'm not going to get to all of them. Uh, so uh, I'm going to get to a, a, a good few. So let's get cracking, shall we? Uh, Leopold and Love Day. What handy tricks did you learn to do why you impoverished? Why you were impoverished? And do you still use um, that you still use or do today? Uh, well, so yeah, I had um, I had no money growing up, as you know, but I didn't need it because I was living at home and uh, didn't leave home till I was um eighteen went to college uh, and then was some um, piss poor after that for a few years as well <laughs> I'm uh, what did I learn that I still do today well I don't waste money well depends what you mean by that I don't I don't uh, do you know I don't do uh, drugs or fast cars or wear designer t-shirts that cost a thousand. I don't know any of that nonsense. Um, it's just because it doesn't interest me. It's not like I'm thinking I'm saving money. But then I do, I do waste money now and again where you'd think that, you know, I, I, like, I take a helicopter so I don't miss a gig. You know what I mean? So it depends what you mean. Um, but no, I, 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 don't, I don't really have... I don't have material things except a, a house. Um, I, I get what I, what do I do? Uh, what tricks? I still darn socks. I darn, darn my socks. If I, I, I'll tell you why, right? If I've got a lovely pair of socks, right? I've got a lovely pair of socks on, right? And there's a little hole where my stupid toenails done, a little hole like that, right? I go, oh, I can't wear it because that annoys me. That's probably some sort of OCD. I think I know there's a hole in that sock. I can't wear that. But I'm not going to throw it away because that ruins the pair. See, that to me is wasting money, just throwing away a pair of socks with a tiny hole. So I darn it, it takes two minutes. It takes me a while to thread the needle now. <laughs> you see me trying to read with my eyesight. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't waste money. I still know the value of money, if you know what I mean. Um, uh, so yeah, I won't, if there's something that's going to go off in the fridge, I think, well, I'll eat that. That's mad to throw that away. If I, so uh, that's eating though, isn't it? So, <laughs> he's a martyr. He eats, he eats anything. <laughs> he's trying to save the planet. He's not a fat, greedy pig. He's trying to save the planet. So that's, that's what I say. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't waste good things. If something's still good, I'll still use it. Um, would you, Joey, would you rather, uh, right. <laughs> would you rather always have your head on back to front Always. Like that's something you, if you could change it, you'd ever have it on the wrong way around. Um, would, would you rather always have your head on back to front or have it on the right way but see upside down? It's a good question, Joey, for a cat. Um, so, I, I heads on backwards. So I've got to walk. So basically, 
Would I rather walk backwards everywhere or have the world upside down? I've got to choose walking backwards because you get used to that. You're just walking backwards. It's not great. It's not ideal. <laughs> That's not how we evolved. But rather than see the world upside down, they did an experiment, um, I think it might have been the 60s, where they gave this guy sort of goggles that turned everything upside down and they like filmed him for a, a week. He was never allowed to take them off. And you see him first t t turn his drink upside down. And then you see him, he got good at it. He got used to everything. So he could, you know, he could catch a ball because he knew that the ball went down and then up in his face, in his eyes, in his head. But actually it was doing that. And so he could, he'd learn to catch it because initially, you know what I mean? And then after a week they took it off and he had to relearn it. Like the first thing he did was pour his drink upside down because he was used to it the other way around. So you can get used to it, but it must be easier to walk backwards everywhere and see everything normal than have to convert everything in your brain, mustn't it? Why am I even answering that question? <laughs> like, when is that ever gonna be a thing for me to worry about? Some evil scientist, he's got me tied down in a cave, right? And he's going, well, Mr. Gervais, you have a choice. <laughs> when is he That's my answer. Head on backwards, walking backwards everywhere. That's difficult though, isn't it? Because then you've got to, that is difficult. Because your hands are that way, aren't they? Even having a wee. You're standing up. Is that right? I've got my hat. No, that hasn't changed, has it? So my head's on backwards, so that's all right, yeah. But I just can't, I can't look down at what I'm doing. It is tricky. I love the fact that weeing was the first thing that came to my head, because I've, I've got a wee anxiety. I can't pass the toilet, I think, I might need a wee in 10 minutes. If, if, I, if I'm going to sleep, I think, do I need a wee? If I think it, I go, well, you've got to have one now. Otherwise, you will want one. So, <laughs> with all the problem of having your head on backwards, my first one was having a wee would be tricky. Okay, <laughs> now, Julia, if you were buying a time capsule, bury it, fuck me, sorry about my eyesight. This, that, that, right. If you were burying a time capsule in your garden in order for future generations or aliens <laughs> to discover what three things oh what three things would you put inside to sum up the world we live in today that's tricky isn't it because it, it would be backwards technology wouldn't it they wouldn't be impressed by anything so it would be funny. So I, th I assume it would be something like social or fashion or... I don't just mean fashion. I mean things we do socially, culturally. What would be the big things? What, what, what if, I mean, people... Are, okay, even in a few hundred years, people are going to look back at us and they're going to think... We were mental. Like we look back at medieval people, the things they did. They're gonna go. What do you mean you? You tortured animals. What do you mean you? You know what I mean? They're gonna go. What, why did you do that? I mean, even I think even like factory farming. People go. You did what? What do you mean you enslaved dolphins for tricks? What sort of? So it's gonna be it'd be weird stuff like that. But they're going to know about that, aren't they? Uh, basically, is your question what sums up now? I suppose social media's had a massive effect, doesn't it? Because we've always, we've always sort of like, we've always gossiped to sort of control the tribe. But then when we got too big, we couldn't do that. And social media still allows us to 
gossip. We've talked about this before that, you know, that you, and so you want to raise your status and there's two ways to do that. One is competence, be good at summer, be revered. The other is virtue, have virtue. And, and social media allow people to just do virtue signal, just try and bring people down. So that is a big, that's had a big effect on society. That sort of mob rule, that, that culture war. So I think social media, uh, uh, what else? Well, I mean, computers. Again, though, they're not going to be impressed, are they? Because they're going to, they're going to have artificial. They're going to have robots digging it up, going, "Look at this! Look what you humans used to do." They're going to have robots taking the piss out of us. <laughs> it's going to be a sad box, isn't it? It's going to be. It's going to be like. It's going to be a note. It's a note from. Uh, Comedian, he was a he was a megastar in the day, and he says we used to eat animals and do Twitter. <laughs> Brilliant, yeah, we know we've got history books. Good question though. Um, Gunner and Andy, with Afterlife going to the live stage, oh, there was a production in Prague. Um, I wish I'd, I wish I'd seen that. I think they're still going to do some more as well. If you're in Prague, go and see Afterlife, the play. Um, with Afterlife going to the live stage, is there a singular, all-encompassing, coherent, theoretical framework of physics <laughs> that fully explains and links together all physical aspects of the universe? Great question, Gunnar. And Andy, the answer's no. There isn't. So do you mean if there's one, if there would be one rule of the universe that is never deviated from in quantum physics or Newtonian physics or in all aspects of life, one thing that says it's still true? I mean, I, no, I, I can't think. All things... All, every, all things are made of atoms, but not everything is a thing, is it? Because there's nothingness. It's that, th that, that, that question where people say, um, why, why is there something instead of nothing? Well, actually, they've balanced the universe and they've worked out that it's an average of nothing with matter and antimatter. So actually, the universe, on average, is nothing. Which is mind-blowing. And it's also, it's, it's nearly meaningless. Quantum physics is nearly, it's like the closest thing to magic without being magic, with there being laws and rules. Is there one thing, uh, nothing can exist without gravity, I suppose. Although gravity was like, wasn't it like a billy second late? Wasn't there, wasn't there nothing and then Something and then gravity. Uh, uh, matter can't be. I suppose matter, uh, energy can't be created or destroyed. Oh, I don't know. Any physicist out there, answer that stupid question from two dogs. Oh, there's another one. Another dog, I mean, Monsieur Dougal. Bonjour, Monsieur Ricky. Do you think slugs lack evolutionary ambition? <laughs> Every day I try to learn a new trick to better myself in the hope that one day my distant relatives will be flying French bulldogs. Um, I have never seen a slug fetch a stick. Another great question. Well, one... Just because you bet yourself doesn't mean your offspring will because you can't pass on acquired characteristics. Bodybuilders don't have big kids, do they? Because they did that themselves. So on a genetic level. So, But I see your point. It's good to bet yourself, Dougal. It's good. Keep doing it. Don't worry about your offspring. Do it for yourself. <laughs> Be your own dog. Um... No, slugs don't... Well, all, all animals lack evolutionary ambition. No animal tries to evolve. That's the, 
mistake people make. They think evolution has a will. It doesn't have a will. It's, you know, it, it's, um, it's change over time by small mutations uh, and they either work or they don't, which is natural selection. Um, so there's no will to everything. And also, this myth that slugs aren't as evolved as us, they are. They are as exactly evolved as us because they're around. We all came from the same thing. We all came from a, a single blob of protein. They got it right. They, they got it right. They don't need to, if you don't need to change, don't. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. One thing that's always confused me about the gastropods, um, slugs and snails, a snail can't live without a shell, can it? But a slug's not bothered. So, is that snail exaggerating about how important this shell is? Is he going, oh, I need that shell? But then, if you take a slug, if you take a slug, if you take a shell off a snail, it's fucked. But a slug going, what's up with you, mate? What's up with you? It's like when I was a teenager and I, I first saw the railway children, and all these these rich kids, they were poor suddenly. I thought. Well, 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 welcome to the real world. I didn't feel... <laughs> so, I'm like the slug in that scenario. When the snail, when the snail loses his shell, I go, well, fucking welcome. I've never had a fucking shell, mate. <laughs> Is that a good metaphor? <laughs> oh, God. No, they're, slugs are perfect. Everything that exists is doing it right. 99% of all species that have ever existed have been extinct. They didn't work. Something happened. I mean, we're killing more and more, obviously, the way we act. So we're, we've got it coming. We've fucked with the ecosystem. We've got it coming. We need all these things. They're there for a reason. Um, uh, cause it, only because it works. I don't mean they're there for a moral reason or they have will. I mean, it, it works. If you don't interfere with it, it works. Nature works, by definition. If it exists, it works. So no, the slug's got it right. Don't diss them. Don't diss a slug. Uh, Mel, Toffee and Fudge. How would you react if someone was in your seat at a theatre, etc.? Ask nicely, or your way. I, I do, uh, my way, I, I always ask nicely. <laughs> I'm not... I'm not really rude. That's my persona, you know. Just because I, in my shows, I call a kid a tubby little ginger cunt. I don't do that in real life. Also, he wasn't there in that scene. People think that, people go, oh, what did that poor kid say? He wasn't there. We filmed that bit without him. Uh, so I'm not really like that. Um, depends, isn't it? If I come back to my, is it, is it, is it a frail old lady? Or is it a massive bloke with a tattooed neck? <laughs> right, so me and Jane went to see um, the Knicks a few years ago in New York with, with like front row seats, right? of course. I'm a VIP. Um, so you're right on the court with front row seats. And, uh, and um, Hugh Jackman was there with his wife, sat next. So it's me, Hugh Jackman, his wife, Jane. In comes Evander Holyfield, right? And sits next to Jane, right? And he's a big guy, right? He's a big guy, right? And uh, he's, he can't help but sort of, you know, be bigger than his seat. And at one point, Jane went to me, oh God, he's, he's sort of, Squishing me onto my seat, like that, right? And I went, what do you want me to do about it? It's fucking Amanda Holyfield, what am I gonna... <laughs> I said, fucking ask Wolverine. <laughs> Unbelievable. So, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> oh, it was in my seat. True story, that. 
Daniel. Happy birthday, Daniel. Um, lots of people have said, say happy birthday to you, so that's for them as well, and you. Here's Daniel's question. There can be a lot of negatives about using Twitter, but why do you enjoy it, and what keeps you on the platform? Well, the first thing is, it's useful. It's a useful marketing tool for me. It, it reaches a lot of people, um, so uh, uh, you can do good things with it. Not just selfish things like um, buy my DVD, but uh, the single best thing about it is uh, animal charities, you know, particularly with things like petitions. As I, I said in my humanity show, you know, a few years ago, it take you months, years to get a hundred thousand signatures standing outside a supermarket. Now you can do that in a few days, if you you know, and that and that's what makes the difference because then you get it. I think it gets to be asked in Parliament. Well, there's 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 uh, there's stages to it, but so so doing good things, charity number one, I'd say. Two marketing, I do it. I I mostly use it for marketing my stuff. Um, uh, it's a good sample. Um, uh, so you see trends quite quickly, you know, I, I mean, even the news gets its news from Twitter sometimes. Uh, uh, but I'd say, I'd say, uh, and meeting you, idiots. Meeting you, absolute <laughs> cats and dogs and stuff like that. Good question. No meet Pete. We've been through this. Um, what were your favourite comedy TV shows when you were a kid? Also, do you remember the first record you bought? With your own money, I do. I'll answer that one first. It was Stranded by Roxy Music. Went into town, saved up money. What would I have been? 12 or 13? Uh, I can't remember the name of the shop. I know it was Quicksilver or another one. It's in the butt centre in Reading. I, I, I know I had to go up the escalator to a little shop and it was a cool, it was really cool. It's one of those shops that's like really dark with a red light. You know what I mean? Lava lamps, joysticks. It was one of those. And I thought, I remember, oh, I felt so grown up. Yeah, Stranded by Roxy Music. I think I'd only heard one track. I think I'd heard Street Life and I took a chance. But it was different in those days because you loved having an album. Now there's so many. I don't know what albums are called now. I don't know what songs. I like songs. I don't know the name of the song and I don't know who sang it. I just like the song. But then you knew everything. I'd, I'd learn the lyrics. I knew the, 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 the band. I knew who the engineer was. I'd sit there and listen to an album like that, reading the, the notes. And now you just don't. Well, some people do. Um, uh, so yeah, that was my first... Um, album that I bought with my own money. Uh, what was the first part of the question? What was your favourite TV shows when you were a kid? What do you mean by kid though? Because I'd have, I'd have acquired what my mum and dad were watching. So I'd have liked those. I'd have probably watched and liked on the buses when I was a kid. Um, but because I had older brothers and sisters, I probably, I probably um, got into things that I was probably too young for, like Monty Python. Uh, and then, when do you really start saying, you know, wearing it as an identity? Um, probably, probably Forty Towers, that I would learn, I would learn the, the lines and wanted to tell people that I was a Forty Towers fan. Uh, but the way then I was, what would I have been then? 14. Um, so that was my lineage really, 
mainstream stuff. And I still and I still liked good mainstream stuff like Rising Down and Porridge and all those things. Then the American ones I started, you know, getting into like you know, Taxi and and those sort of things. Uh, but I'd say Forty Towers was my first badge of honour that was my sort of thing that I thought was brilliant. Uh, good. Um, Louise, my question for your consideration is, have there been any jokes which you've loved but didn't get the reaction you expected at the New Material Nights? Do you keep going with it, tweaking them? When do you start, decide to remove them? Have you got an example? It depends. Um, first of all, I sort of changed my approach. The first few stand-ups, I sort of wrote them and went out and practiced them. And you're sort of committed to making it work. Uh, and sort of from humanity onwards, I've sort of gone the other way. I go out and I use stage time. Like during the week, I'll think of something, but I won't, I won't write it or work. I'll go, oh, I can't wait to say that Monday and see if it works. Because I think stage time is worth about 10 times writing time. It doesn't matter how good you think it is. Or exactly right. When you get out there, it, it, you don't know until you say it. You don't know until they laugh or not. Um, uh, I don't know what the hit rate is. If a joke works, it's usually sort of 80% there, if you're a comedian. It's usually 80% there when you say it and you can just get it better and hone it. Um, and if things sort of semi-work, if you do it 50 times, they work. You just get better at them. Even if you say the same thing 50 times, your timing, your breathing, the way you hit, it makes it better. Uh, some things, I don't know, some things don't get a big laugh, but you expect that. The first time you say anything, you shouldn't get a laugh. Unless the very, unless the very subject matter is funny, like you shouldn't be saying it. So it depends really. And a lot, lot more I rely, I rely on my persona more than I did because people know me now. So, I've got, so it's 50% attitude. People are waiting to see my take on the subject. It's almost, it's almost not the subject or the jokes or the words. It's, aha, that's his take on it. Do you see what I'm saying? Stand up, a lot of stand up is attitude. Particularly if you don't do jokes like me, I take a stance. So, and that stance might be getting it completely wrong. That might be the funny bit. I'm getting it wrong. I'm taking the wrong side. Um, sometimes it's just something annoys me that's funny, anger's funny. So I can be right, I can be right about something and they can identify with that and they like to see me getting angry. So it depends. Um, and I don't usually do those sort of routines that are, that are deconstructing something and taking it to its logical conclusion like Seinfeld, um, uh, mine's more infused with attitude. Uh, so, uh, what's the hit rate? I don't know. You probably, I, I probably do, if, if I tried out a, a, a new 100 minutes, I'd say you'd bother with 50 of it, the 50, but you know, because you don't need, and you keep crunching it as well. Like, I've done about 40 or 50, and I'm still on 45 minutes. That's because even though I'm doing more, the good stuff's got tighter. So I've, there's more in this, there's twice as much in this show as there was, and it's still 45 minutes. <laughs> so um, just keep honing it. Just keep folding the samurai sword. Getting better, new things happen. Some routines don't work, because they're not quite, you got to laugh because it was topical. That day, you got a laugh for breaking the ice or the elephant in the room. So it depends. I try to do timeless stuff. So it's funny, you know, AIDS, famine, cancer, <laughs> Hitler. <laughs> Those evergreen things. And just find a new angle. Um, but it just depends. It just depends. Right, last question. 
Oh no, I've got two. Oh no, I've got, oh fuck me, the baby taco. Hi, granddad. Right, this is a taco talking, who now thinks it's a baby, right? Fuck me, what has, what has my life become? Hi, granddad. Me is a big taco now, with almost no more poopy pants. This hurts to even say this shit. What are your, th what are your three favourite swear words, and how old were you when you started swearing? Well, I never swore in front of my mum. Uh, secretly, maybe. I don't know, teenagers, I might have said it at school, made sure I got it out of my head before I went home. Well, it's the old, it's cunt, fuck, fuck, fuck's sake, fucking hell, for fuck's sake. Oh, fuck me. Fucking hell. <laughs> it's the cunt and all the fucks, really. And then lesser ones like bollocks and twat. Thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> Should I be talking to a baby taco like that? Um, they've gone way over now. Oh, God, okay. Rachel, do you swear a lot in everyday life? That's funny, isn't it? Um, Martin is always telling me how much I swear. I say, fuck off, do I? I do swear too much. Sometimes for fun. Sometimes just because it's f funny. For no reason, fuck's sake. Like, it could be anything. <laughs> like, <laughs> if, uh, if Jane, this is a the thing now, if Jane sort of like, oh, trips down the turbo, or like trips on a, a route or something, where we're walking, she's just like, just a little trip, I shout twat, really loudly, like that, right? And it's got to the point now where we were walking and someone in front of us tripped a little bit and I went Tw and I just had to stop myself. <laughs> oh God. Um, last question. Doris, any plans for another series or are you sticking to stand up? There are plans for another series. I should be writing it now, but I'm loving stand up so much. I'm putting it off and putting it off. I will do another one before I die, hopefully. But if I had to do one thing for the rest of my life, it would be stand up. Um, I can't wait. I can't wait to get um, Armageddon going, tour it, film it, put it out, and start again. But I should. I, I have got an idea for a new series. I've written about eight pages because <laughs> I'm loving stand up too much. Um, so yeah, um, be nice to animals. Uh, adopt. Don't shop. Um, thanks for following. Uh, see you soon. Tatty bye, everyone.